Two of the top goaltending stories of the 2018-19 NHL season have been authored by a couple of very different rookies. Carter Hart is a first-year pro who has been called up from the American Hockey League to the NHL after just a couple of months in the minors. And Philadelphia Flyer fans feel it took too long, even at two months. Then there's Jordan Bennington, a 2011 draft pick who, after spending years trying to pick the lock and find his way into the NHL, just decided to raise his foot and boot the door down this winter. He is an NHL regular, and he has the St. Louis Blues in the playoffs writing this Cinderella script. Hi, everybody. Welcome to In Goal Radio, the podcast. I'm Darren Millard. As we look at different routes to the NHL, that's our theme today in the feature interview. As we chat with somebody who has gone from overseas to to North America, the college route, and is now in the American Hockey League. His name is... Kasimir Kaskisua. Yes, that's what I said, didn't I? Let's hear it again. Kasimir Kaskisua. Thank you. Yes, a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs organization. We'll make sure you know how to say his name. And then there's the listener questions. And this has been an impressive part about the In Goal podcast. As you have flooded us with inquiries... We have three questions today, all three friends of Ingool, the podcast, and one of which was a Vesna Trophy finalist last year. He will give his answer to your question as we bring in the co-founders of Ingool magazine, Kevin Woodley and David Hutchison, Darren Millard with you here in the studio. And uh, gentlemen, we have, uh, we have a real breakthrough in the backup goalie towel. Hutch, did you see what happened the other day in Philadelphia? Absolute brilliance. I can't believe, Darren, that you've started a wave in the National Hockey League already. Yeah, Mike McKenna, uh, for those of for those that didn't see it on our social media and others and on Mike's social media, um, sort of the, the lead dog here as, uh, is back in the NHL, was back on the bench, and he was back with a backup towel in back-to-back games against the Detroit Red Wings at home with the bright orange on the road with the white, looking very stylish. Other people are picking it up. Um, and I, and I will say this, uh, as much as McKenna deserved, I think to be the first one, he almost wasn't, I'm not going to name names, but there was another NHL goaltender who had decided he was going to put the backup towel on the bench on Thursday night, a couple nights before Mike got to do it and he couldn't get it right. He couldn't get the fold and the tuck. He wasn't comfortable. He bailed. We had a photographer there and yeah, we had a photographer on site and everything and he bailed, uh, again, not going to call him out by name. Because this is a lost art. And this is what I'm saying to Mike. Now we need an instructional video. And he's promised one is coming at the end of the season when he's done. So that he can not only inspire this next generation of goaltenders to wear the backup towel. But show them how to do it properly. Because it has become a lost art. Well, and it's not just any towel. We've had a number of people send us notes saying, can we get an in-goal backup towel now? I can't believe it. But uh, it actually takes a little bit of product research so we can find the right one to put our logo on. But uh, I'm sure before the season's over, we'll have some towels. So some high-quality thread count, too, uh, in those backup goaltender towels. Cotton. It was great that Mike McKenna uh, made the breakthrough in the backup goaltender towel because in the interview a couple of weeks ago, we talked about going old school. And in a conversation afterwards, he was bringing up the the skate saves, which uh, which we played you some of that audio uh, previously. And McKenna and his skate save spilled over to the podcast The Chirp with Darren Millard when I had Byron Defoe. You guys remember him for the Boston Bruins, but Absolutely. Atlanta and, Lord and L.A. And, and, yeah, Lord Byron. And we get into the Lord Byron thing. But he was the, the guest on, on episode 10 of The Chirp. And we got into talking about goalie coaches and discussing things about training. And he mentioned skate saves, which got me thinking about McKenna. And whether or not you work with a goalie coach and you're asked to do these strange drills. And he brought up one of the first encounters that he had with a member of the Boston Bruins. That would be Hall of Famer Jerry Cheevers. This is Byron Defoe on the shirt. And then uh, when I got traded to Boston, the first guy to come out on the ice with me was uh, Jerry Cheevers. And uh, so I, I thought that was the best thing going. I mean, I loved watching Jerry Cheevers back in the day. What did Cheesy and- tell you? Oh my God. So I, I kid you not. And he'll back this up. Very first practice, you know, I'm, I'm new to Boston, big trade that summer and we're on the ice and 
it's just me, uh, Jim Carrey and him and a couple shooters. And he's like, okay, uh, Byron, we're going to, we're going to warm you up here. So getting that, let's work on some skate saves. And I looked at him and I, I said, skate saves? <laughs> Jerry, I haven't made a skate save in nine years. Um, <laughs> we're doing this thing called a butterfly now. <laughs> and I, I kid you not. And he said, Byron, just humor me, some skate saves. So sure, sure enough, I, you know, turn the toe out, stretch it out, make a skate save. <laughs> so Jerry was uh, not the most uh, technical uh, type of coach, but honestly, off the ice, just, you know, I'd go and grab a beer with him, or if I was in a tough stretch, I'd give him a call. And uh, he was so good mentally to talk to because, you know, what he accomplished, right? And, and uh, you know, just, again, someone who understands the position, is only another goaltender you know a border defenseman or a coach they, they have no idea what goes on so guys you're asked by a hall of famer to make skate saves to warm up what do you do do you guys uh, do what byron did and just go along with it dude i wouldn't even know where to start. like like i have this problem i mean we've identified in earlier episodes that i'm sort of the late comer to the party of goaltending in terms of learning it even despite being in my mid-40s I don't even know how to stack the pads properly. I wouldn't know where to start with a skate save. We need you to try that in one of your games, and we need to get a camera there, Woody. Yeah. I, I grew up um, trying to make skate saves, and uh, other than my height, I claim that's the reason I didn't get very far in my career. I never could figure out the skate save, although I did have the paddy stack in my arsenal. Good on, good on Defoe for going with it, though, because it's actually exactly. a really good lesson for kids because you're going to have coaches who are going to ask you to do things – and uh, and arguing is never the right route. So good on him, and it turned into a good friendship. You were telling us, yeah, a, a very good uh, relationship between uh, the Hall of Famer Jerry Cheevers and Byron Defoe. Again, that was on the chirp. So uh, there's a couple of two good stories about uh, about relationships working, and one that's working right now is the Calgary Flames, David Riddick and and Mike Smith. And there's a competition there again, and just just a, a little bit uh, of of an update because. Woodley, there was a lot of talk at a certain point of this year that Brad Trey Living and the Calgary Flames would be going out and trying to strengthen their goaltending. Uh, what's the latest as we approach the trade deadline? Well, obviously, we had Jordan Sigalette on last week, the Calgary Flames goaltending coach. And I got to say, I, I didn't get that impression. Um, one of the things he said to me uh, when I talked about Riddich's lack of playoff experience was as much as they think he's solved that, and we can talk a little bit about um, some of the things that David has done, he also felt like the other guy was going to get on a roll, and that guy is Mike Smith. And now we've seen him with three straight starts. He's won two of them, lost the other one, I think, in a shootout or overtime. Um, so Mike Smith, a guy who's getting on a bit of a roll. And, you know, this hasn't been an easy year for Mike, and I think he'd be the first one to tell you. New coach, new system. Uh, they don't give up a ton of shots a lot of nights, and that's something where he's typically better when he's seeing a little more rubber. Um, and David Riddich got in a role and Mike Smith's not a guy who's used to playing, you know, once every four or five games. And so it's been an adjustment, but he is a guy amidst all this talk of the flames getting help. Smith's a guy when you compare about the names that are out there, short of going out and getting a Jimmy Howard, which is going to cost you a first round pick maybe, or a Sergei Bobrovsky. The rest of these guys you're looking at is probably more one B's and Mike Smith's a guy that they feel if he needs to go in there on a consistent basis or if you need a stretch out of him he's still very capable of that we're just a year removed for the first half of last year he was the flames best player so i think that feeling and that trust is still there with him and i think there's also a belief in riddich who you know talked to me about he you know he spent some time in the summer uh, working out with the san jose prospect back in the czech republic really focused on sort of the competition aspect of his off-season training, whether it was on the ice, off the ice, playing tennis, and making sure that he had sort of learned lessons from last year when losses piled up and he didn't deal with it very well. And I, So I think the two of them are, you know, Smith's been there, done that, and Riddich, they feel like he's better prepared for a stretch drive and a playoff run, and I think they're comfortable with the two of them. I don't think you'll see them go out and get help. You know what I liked about Mike Smith was – when he gave it to Jonathan Hubert out the other day, I don't have anything against Jonathan Hubert out, but they got into it in a shootout and maybe wonder, can your goalie get kicked out in a shootout? Uh, he can if he gets into a fight, but it's at the discretion of the ref. So a goalie could get into a fight in the shootout and conceivably stay in the game, which I had no idea. There's something that makes you uh, think and ask questions. Uh, the Calgary Flames are going to stand pat. So anything else you're seeing on the goaltending front prior to the trade deadline? 
Well, obviously, we saw a big one drop this week with the Flyers um, acquiring Cam Talbot uh, from the Ed- Edmonton Oilers in exchange for Anthony Stolers. And a couple interesting aspects there. One's been talked about, but maybe not by everybody, and that's the fact that Stolers needs 10 games this year. Otherwise, he becomes an unrestricted free agent. But I think in Edmonton, they see him as a, as a project with some upside. Um, if they can retain his services and maybe a bridge, they've got a whole bunch of good young goaltenders coming a couple of years from now, guys that are sort of getting their feet wet in the AHL and the East Coast Hockey League, and maybe Stolers can kind of bridge that gap between Koskinen and them. Um, there are some things in his game that I think they see as quite fixable with time, and hopefully they get that time. And on the other end, I think a lot of people talking about you know, Cam Talbot is a quote-unquote mentor for Carter Hart and a lot of people talking about the relationship they have. The one aspect that I've sort of seen missed in that is is Dustin Schwartz, the Edmonton Oilers goaltending coach. Um, and he's the bond between those two, between Talbot, between Hart, because when Talbot was in Edmonton, he worked with Schwartz um, in the off season, and Carter Hart has been a guy who's worked with Dustin Schwartz since he was like 11 years old. So a strong relationship there. And uh, obviously they all hit it off and they worked throughout uh, throughout last summer. So I wondered, like, is that going to continue? Because for that mentorship to have any value beyond this year, you'd kind of think that, that Nat needs right. to keep up. And hey, is, is Talbot staying in Edmonton after they dealt him away? Uh, but my understanding is, yes, they are going to uh, continue to work together in the summer. So, you know, if the Flyers are all in on Camp Talbot, they've got a guy there that... Um, you know, that I think is going to spend time with Hart this summer and is going to continue to build that relationship. And uh, we've seen in other cases, uh, Brassois and Hellebuck in Winnipeg this year, uh, there can be a real value to having a partnership that extends outside of the regular season and a friendship off the ice as well. And with Brassois going into Winnipeg, it uh, it kind of clogged things up a little bit there. Yeah, and that's another name, I think. Like, you know, where everybody's looking at the Bobrovsky, unrestricted free agent, Jimmy Howard. I still think he ends up resigning in Detroit. Um but a name that I haven't seen out there a lot that I think could have the biggest impact goaltending-wise at this trade deadline at least a couple of years from now is Eric Comrie. Um, Winnipeg Jets currently stuck in the number three role. When we see Hart, um, when we see Bennington, when we see Demko up in the NHL, I think there's a lot of people that believe Eric Comrie's ready to take that step, has probably been ready to take that step for a while. Uh, for whatever reason, it's pretty clear that opportunity is not going to exist in Winnipeg or it doesn't look like it's going to exist in Winnipeg with, with the current coaching staff. And so, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see him. I, I, like, I expect him to move by the summer. And as Winnipeg's probably a buyer at this trade deadline, to me, he's an asset they could use as part of a package. You know, Malcolm Subban is another name that, that pops into my head when you talk about uh, being a part of an organization and just not getting that chance or not taking advantage of that opportunity. And we saw that with, with Boston, and it just didn't work out in his, his various starts. And now he's carved out a decent little place for himself with the Vegas Golden Knights. So we'll watch with great interest uh, at the trade deadline on the goaltending front. But Hutch, uh, Woody, we got an opportunity recently to connect with a netminder who's uh, not on the on the trade front right now, but whose love for the position and perseverance uh, for the position is certainly shown through in his skills and the way he's done a good job of putting himself on the map. As in goal welcomes, do you guys do you guys want to introduce him? No chance. Okay. Here's here's our feature interview of the week. I admit it, it's an unusual way to begin an interview, but at In Goal, the podcast, we want to make sure we have our bases covered. And Woody and, and Hutch haven't been around in the Toronto Marlies very much. So we start at the very, very beginning. Casimir, how do you say your name? You want the Finnish version? Casimir uh, Kaskiswa. Okay, now how will these two say it? Uh, yeah, Kaz, Kaz works for me. It's hard Kaz. to uh, hard to listen to some some of my teammates say my name, so Kaz is good. What's a, what's the worst in arena effort trying to say your name? There's been a lot of variations, especially in college. There's been a lot of a lot of tough ones. Uh, um, they keep well, they keep changing the letters all over Kaskiso, Kaskiso, and Oh, everything you can think of, uh, I've heard it all. Now, you're a professional athlete now. Do you ever worry about it anymore, or is it just old? Uh, at this point, I kind of expect them to get it wrong, so it's kind of it's fun when they, when they butcher it. 
The place they always get it right was Finland. At, at least, I hope so. Yes. You left Finland for North America before most people do. Walk us through that decision. Um, yeah, so I was playing under 20 in in Helsinki. So three years of juniors there, and I was... I felt like I was a little stuck. I was always behind really good goalies. All of them, all of them got drafted to the NHL after I think they played with me. So uh, one was uh, Duohima. He plays. He got drafted by the Oilers. Uh, he played yeah. in the American League for a little bit. Now he's in, back in Finland. And second year was Scorpisalo, who's playing for Columbus right now. And then third year it was Kevin Lankinen. Uh, definitely, definitely some good goalies playing with and playing behind. So. Um, it was kind of tough not playing games, but then that since those guys were so good, it kind of kept my hope alive and that I, you know, I still might be a good goalie. So after those three years, I was going into my last year of uh, junior eligibility. So I, a lot of my good friends in Finland decided to go college route. So those were pretty much the only Finnish guys who were looking at that route. So talking, talking to those guys and they were just, finish up their first year or uh, committed to school. So I decided to uh, give it a try. So I'm like, it was, it was good for me. So um, decided to play one year junior hockey in in the States and then try to get a scholarship through there. So essentially there were too many good Finnish goalies in Yokurt at the time. I wanted to ask a little bit about your development. We hear so much about Finnish goaltending and the instruction they received coming up. Like, when did you become a goaltender? When did you get your first goalie coach? Walk us through some of the progressions while you were still back home. Um, I think I started playing goalie for good when uh, probably seven years old or something. And then the team started uh, rotating players in, in goal. And I think I was the goalie once and I said I can I can. I can do this every practice. I liked it so much. So um, from there on out, and then always from day one, we've had some kind of goalie coach every time on the ice. So uh, just even get the basics and just get some kind of reps in. That's always been uh, really helpful. What um, what made you love the position? We always I, I tend to always ask questions about coaching and technique, but what why did you love it first? What got you into it? Um, to be honest, I think. The gear, everybody would say, the gear had a huge impact on that. And then it was just different. I didn't have to skate out that much. I didn't really like running or skating. Still don't. <laughs> but so I could just hang around in the net. And I was I was actually good at it, too. So that helped. That helped. But I've seen, uh, I've seen some video of me in skating school at two years old. And I was... I was leaning against the post in front of the net from back then. So I think I've always kind of drawn, drawn to the crease. Speaking of gear, I, I saw that you've uh, put your favorite rock stars on your helmet for this season. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about who those guys are and, and why they're important for you? Yeah, so I have uh, Chris Cornell slash uh, Kirk Cobain and Dave Grohl on it. So... Um, Kind of try to do it as minimalistic as I could, just go team first. But I had some room on the mask to do something like that, so decided to go with those guys. Uh, yeah, always been a big rock guy, um, especially uh, the last last few years. Really gotten into like the 1990s grunge from Seattle, so that's been that's been a big part. So um, decided to take that opportunity and put those guys on the mask what about uh first sets like what's when we talk about being a gear guy what was the set that you wanted most growing up the first one maybe you got under the tree at christmas what really turned you on to the gear um i think i bounce a lot during between gear makers a lot uh, i've worn bond and even brian's as a kid and like palas i don't know if that's a finnish brand but that kind of stuff, like oh, some some of that stuff through the team and that they passed along, and um, but always, of course, looking at the finish, finish uh, NHL goalies, and a lot of those guys were Vaughn, so I was in Vaughn for a bit, and then when I was going up in the 
up in juniors in Finland, and they started giving the head me down stuff from the pro guy. So that I think that was CCM and Reebok at the time, and then um, NAHL. I started started wearing Brian's. Which piece of equipment are you most finicky about? That's a tough question. I think I a little bit a little bit of everything. Of course, the pads are the big ones, and um, the glove glove is really important as well. I can probably go through all every piece of equipment say it's important and i want to make sure it's right so okay what do you like in your pads or your gloves uh i've actually changed them a little bit the last few years so that i started a year ago in the optics and they felt amazing right out of the box and then after a couple months i they they were almost too good i couldn't really feel any gear on me so i went to the heritage line get some knee rolls on my pads and a little more weight so i felt like i was a little beefed up i felt a little bigger and then again for this year when talking to josh and when they came up with the genetic four and i felt like that felt like the perfect set for me and taking that little step forward and getting more more uh more performance on my pad so and that's been working out good do you get involved in the the design as well uh yes i'm very detailed of how the gear needs to look <laughs> um and also some little details on the on the performance i i wouldn't say i go as detailed as sparksy does but uh, i especially know how i want my gear to look and then um now we're working working with josh on kind of kind of fixing the the glove to work for my personal preferences a little better so that's that's kind of in the in the process right now. Can you tell us a bit more about that? What is it you're looking for in a glove? Um, I really like the feel of the genetic four, but I'm just kind of trying to work with the pocket a little bit, do some little mods. I feel like it closes in on me a little too much. So trying to open that a little bit, see what Jaws and Rio says of Brian's and trying to, trying to come up with the solution. When you're working on equipment over the years, what, uh, like, are there other goalies you're leaning on? Are there conversations in the room as you try new things, tinker with new things? Is it just the manufacturers who sort of has helped guide you to the preferences you like now? I would definitely say Sparks. He helped out a bunch since he's in Brian's as well. And ever since joining Toronto, we've had, uh, had very heavy conversations on gear and he loves to talk about it. So, so do I. So we go back and forth on what kind of he, he has on his sets and what I have on mine and the reasons behind it. But, um, and then of course there's been guys in CCM and other companies as well. And they, some guys know what they have, some guys don't. So, uh, but I, usually it's more of a protective, especially this year, the chest protectors just kind of playing around asking guys how they feel about theirs and what, what they, uh, what they think. So, um, but yeah, it's always, always an easy conversation in the locker room to talk about gear. I'm curious, what modifications have you made to that chest and arm? Um, switched from Vaughn to Brian's. <laughs> That's what I did. Um, uh, just actually got it last week. Uh, it's, it's a unit, it's a tank, a mobile tank. And I feel, I feel really safe, really protected and, and big in it as well. So that when my bond started breaking down a little bit, I got, couple stingers in the arms and the shoulders and uh it was the right time to uh switch to the brides how big an adjustment has that been because i've talked to guys around the league and what i've heard from a lot of them is it's not so much just about being smaller it's about getting used to something that's completely different on a piece of equipment that you've used in a lot of cases your whole life how tough has that been yeah it was definitely shocking the first time i got my my new size chest protector. I, we were on the ice, and I think Bicker just got his before the season started. And we looked like skaters out there. It felt like they stripped my whole shoulders down. Um, so it definitely looked different. And then at first, he kind of felt tight, but then then it started feeling normal. Of course, you get get a couple of skates in, but for me, the difference was that they made. You know, arms a little smaller and the shoulders, the padding a little smaller. So especially on sharp angle shots, you're doing RVH and you get a shot like not straight on and you get it on your shoulder and those really hurt. And I got big bruises from there. So uh, that was that was probably the 
the biggest biggest difference. Did that affect your confidence? I mean, you're facing shots, you're smaller, head games, you're taking up less space. What about that? I don't think so, at least during games. when. Uh, but definitely when we did did some dead angle shots during practice, you kind of yeah. had, had to think, think twice when, you, when you're leading against the post and you know the guy's going short side. And you almost know it's going to hurt. But um, no, definitely not with this new Bryant. If we could just take it back a little bit to your development, Kaz, I, I'm really interested in the fact that you've, you know, grown up in Europe, played just about every level you can play at in North America. Uh, what does that look like developmentally for you? What is a, how do you have to change your game as you grow with each level? And, and then maybe what are you working on now to, to take the next step as well? Yeah, it's been a, a long, slow process for me, and I've had no issues with it. So coming over to North America, it was my first season as a starter, really, when I was 19, 19, 20 years old in the NAHL. Um, so that's that was a big change in in personal life. I think that season was just everything was exciting, new and fun. So that really affected my game in a positive way, and I was able to put up some good numbers and get that college um, scholarship from there to uh, Minnesota Duluth, and um, played two great years there. Got a lot of experience over uh, like big time games and big crowds and atmospheres playing in front of those like getting that experience so taking a lot of a lot of steps little steps at a time and moving forward and now I'm um three years third year pro and I felt like I've moved up a little bit each year and I'm 25 years old now so I feel like I'm just kind of kind of starting because uh and excited about what's coming ahead because of uh the steps I've been taking forward we hear a lot, Kaz, about you know finished goalie development and the focus of coaching. One of the things we hear a lot about is sort of that focus on active hands uh, over there. What, what what difference have you seen in terms of where the focus is on the coaching staff in North America when you're working with a goalie coach versus, say, growing up over there? And obviously part of it's just your progression and, and new things at every level, but is there a sort of overarching difference in the themes or the focus? The biggest difference I've probably noticed is in – in Finland, you do more of reps, and you're just trying to hammer down your simple movement. So you uh, do your simple push out, stop, slide, catch for a bunch of times. Other than in North America, I've noticed it's more of a game situation. So you might do um, drills where you have to uh, read the read the player if he's going to shoot or pass, and so that's probably the biggest been the biggest difference for me and um it's it's good to do both for sure especially in the start of the year you might want to do the techniques and uh really get comfortable with everything and the little details but then when the game starts to uh to roll you need to get in the game mode and get comfortable in those situations as well do you prefer one approach over the other approach i like to think i have a i have a good mix of both in, a, in my toolbox but um definitely you gotta hammer just the uh, the reps you gotta hammer those down and get good at and comfortable and moving and just get the good habits and technique but then maybe later later on you start putting that those game situations into your practice and just get comfortable reading and reacting and uh, uh getting ready for the game that's great thank you i i find that fascinating because Quite often we think of the European game as being a lot more east west, a lot more pass first, and yet it's over here that you're you're doing more work on on reading the play. Or is that the evolution of the game in North America maybe now? Yeah, I mean I I really couldn't tell a difference if from diff, from North American or European coaches that we we should catch more or anything like not that the the North American guys here are not gonna say that you shouldn't catch it. So um, it's more of just the drills you do and how you approach practice and goalie practice, uh, maybe mentally and what kind of aspects you want to put into it. So you mentioned the mental side of the game there. What's, uh, what are you working on? Uh, how do you, how have you developed that as you've moved up through the different, different levels? Being different situations and getting the experience and playing those games. Um, college was great for that because we, we'd have two games a week and they were all huge games, always 
big crowds and the student sections were full. So that really got you ready for the for the big games. And then, uh, of course, in my first year pro, I was I was in the I was in the East Coast, and that taught me a lot about how to deal with uh, adversity and the pro life and the ups and the downs and um, everything in between. So, um, and then of course you try to do some, some practicing as well, visualization and just trying to get as prepared to games as you can just kind of figure out what, what makes you click. And some guys I listened, Demko said he had a good game when he just showed up to the rink and, <laughs> didn't really think about it but other guys really want to be can't be talked to and really want to be dialed in so you kind of have to uh find the balance and find your way what makes your body feel good and makes your mind mind ready is that something you're on your own with or is that something you're working with your goalie coaches here uh where's how, how are you developing those skills i feel like you kind of have to figure it out yourself um for me just trying a little different things and if something works stick with it and then maybe uh, try to add some new things into it but of course you can with your goalie coach you can ask for tips ask for help what he thinks he might bring into something I think this year John Elkin is trying to get trying to get me to do some uh, meditation and I'm trying to take the aspects of it into my game and my preparation, what I think is I might need. So, um, of course, little things, but I, if it's, if it doesn't come from you within, I don't think it's gonna really work. So you have to, uh, you have to find what really fits yourself. But of course, if listen up, if there's smart people telling you something. Okay. When you, when you came over to North America, Kaz, it was at the height of the, of the rise of Finnish goaltending. There's two ways to look at it. One, you just you just left a factory. The other one is that Finnish goaltending it had currency. So how? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I'm I'm sure that helped me out a bit. That uh, North American junior team had a chance to get a get a Finnish goalie. They probably had a, probably had a really good reputation at the time, and we still do. But um, but just kind of made it easier to take a risk on a finish goalie um and then of course even moving up to college i feel like all those things kind of paved the way and uh made it a little easier other than maybe before it would have been harder for european guys to come over and now i see it now i see it a lot in junior hockey and college hockey there's a bunch of european goalies um so it's really exploded so i think the finish Finnish goaltending really started that. And then, of course, Swedes have done a good job, too. And you see it all over Europe. So what's what's your timeline on tracking your career right now? That's a good question. I've been trying to go year to year, almost game to game as well, because uh, it's been a whirlwind of a, of a pro career for me. So far, I've been tossed around everywhere, faced a lot of adversity. So, um but no, going back to that Demko interview, that was kind of interesting how he uh, had that had that career path all written down. So that kind of got me thinking as well, like, well, okay, so what what are my goals here now going in the future? But to me, it's always kind of been just take advantage every every day and every game and every moment, and uh, make sure you're a better goalie after each day and they're all the little decisions you make to get to the NHL and you're trying to do your best that way. So try not to get too far ahead of myself. Of course, my goal is to play in the NHL and stay in the NHL, but it gets a little overwhelming if I start thinking too far, too far ahead. So trying to go game to game at this point, but of course my, my goals are high and that that's what motivates me and keeps me going. How much do you, do you guys talk about like as a group, with the rest of the Maple Leafs goalies or even maybe the Finnish goalie union, if you've got friends that go like, is there, do you have a support network outside of your goalie coach with other pros or with guys you played with over the years? You know, some guys have like a little chat group that they'll take part in. Like who do you bounce things off outside of your goalie coach? Do you have anyone for that? What I've had so far is pretty much goalie partners. And 
been lucky enough to have a lot of a lot of good goalie partners, even even the, in the organization. Now Freddie's been great. Uh, so has uh, so has Sparks. He's been been great all through my three years, and then um, and even McElhenney was the little time I got to work with him. He was unbelievable and helped me out a bunch. So uh, now that now that Hutchinson is here with the Marlies, like that's been that's been another big step. He's uh, we hit it off right away, and he's been he's been really helpful for me and my game, and just everyday everyday life coming to the rink and having a guy uh, to talk to and uh, bounce ideas and just just chat to. I mean, obviously, speaking to an audience of goaltenders, are there any specifics, like one little anecdote you can share, where there's one thing that maybe he brought or suggested or talked about that you hadn't really thought about in that way before? Um, I don't think we've really gotten into too much detail yet. Um, we've, we've, we went over our gear (laughs) and then just breaking down some games and what happened and some of the goals and maybe even some drills and how do we want to play some, some things. So, um, pretty basic so far, but yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to work with him for the rest of the season and hoping to elevate both of our games that way. You said Hutch, Hutch, your partner, uh, has helped you. Can you expand on that? Just that experience presence, I think. And like I said, we really hit it off right away. So he's been he's been a great friend so far. So just a guy, like a go-to guy in the locker room pretty much. So in that way, like just taking the pressure off a little bit and just to see how he – handles himself and how he shows up to the rink every day. And that's, that's something I can take a lot of pointers out from. So, um, he's seen a lot he's went through a lot. So, um, just hanging out in his presence and talking to him and just hearing what he has to say, that's been, uh, really a uh, helping factor. Kaz, you, you just brought up the Thatcher Demko interview that Woody did. And that's a compliment to this Ingle radio podcast because you're obviously as much a listener as you are a guest. Goalies seek each other out. Yeah, I try to. I love it. Like, uh, I try to. I r- rather listen to podcasts on the way to the rink and back than the same songs over and over again. Um, even though grunge rock never gets old, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's been fun. Like, of course, I, I love to talk goaltending. I love to listen, like here, especially like your guys' outlet now is to hear what other goalies have to say. And uh, even growing up, like I used to hoard all these mag- hockey magazines that have an article about a goaltender, and that's why I got it. So, um, yeah, just I feel like you have to be a goalie nerd and love the game and the the position. So um, that's where that's where it kind of comes from. Now that you've been on this show, what do you want to hear uh, about goaltending in this podcast? Um, probably well, all the goalies want to hear about gear. So, so it was awesome that you had <laughs> jaws, you had jaws on. So that was that was a good start for you guys. But just different goalies at different different times of their career, and just kind of what they went through and what's helped them and I feel like that's what that's what everybody wants to wants to hear and that's what they're tuning in to listen so that's um you know the different stories I mean some goalies who might be struggling like like the Scott Darling story and all that stuff so like even my own my own story has been slow and steady and kind of out of nowhere until I was 20 years old so um just some stories you can relate to and uh, I feel like that's that can be important for some guys in different parts of their career. What's the lesson then for a young goaltender? If you're sitting down with uh, with a kid who's 8, 10, 12 years old and, and you're talking about your career, what what do you take from, from your slow, steady journey and, and what advice do you give to a kid who's just embarking on the game? Um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't really worry about where you're playing um, or if you're playing that much. As long as you're playing in teams and uh getting 
good practice and you're you're loving the game and working hard so um that's that's the important part i feel like a lot of kids stopped playing because they didn't make some elite team somewhere when they were 10 years old or like it it doesn't really matter i remember all those guys who were playing in front of me when we was growing up from 10 years old to 15 years old and i don't think any of those guys really play anymore so um you just got to stick with stick with your game and believe in yourself and work hard so and have fun in the process of course so um never give up and you're going to get some adversity on the way and tough bounces maybe some cuts from teams but it doesn't make you any less of a goalie so and you always have a chance to uh always have a chance to figure it out and stop stop pucks and once you stop them all like people are going to want you want you did you have a lot of support at home to help you through those bumpy times yeah for sure i mean i always believed in myself i always i always knew i was gonna make it if i just keep at it and um of course even making the decision to uh come over to north america and play i think my mom said why didn't you do it earlier in a way so um yeah everything's everything's worked out for me i've been patient and i've been taking uh taking the steps that i personally feel like i i needed to take and um yeah definitely no not any crazy pressure or anything like that growing up so um i feel like it's all kind of worked into my favor so now you're a new father and uh congratulations from all of us on that how's Thank that you. uh how's that affected you as a goaltender as a person uh, i think we all look at the pros and we say you know why didn't he do this why didn't he do that we all sort of forget that there's there's a life behind all of that so how's that affected you and and more importantly are you going to let your daughter be a goaltender uh, i might try to give her a uh, tennis racket or golf clubs trying to push her that way uh, uh, but I think my like it, I don't think it affected me or my game even when my wife was late pregnant or anything like that. But I think my coach think it will affected me a little bit. So and when they weekly they came and chatted to me and like oh, is everything good at home? Like are you doing good? Like I think that got me overthinking a little bit that is everything good at home? But um, not no I don't think it affected and now uh, it's been it's been great. Like even having some worries or maybe a bad game or some bad goals and you come home to, and there's a little baby daughter waiting, like you kind of, like everybody says, you kind of forget about all that other stuff. So, uh, it's been fun. It's been fun. a lot of, a lot of, uh, energy I've gotten out of it and a lot of boost to bring to the rink. So, uh, just to have that kind of balance to come home to and, um it's been it's been great so so far before we let you go i know you love pets but you also live in a different part of the toronto area i mean we're almost neighbors yeah three dogs two huskies and uh you can call me weird but i we have three cats as well so i might be stapled as a as a lunatic right now but uh yeah just li- living a little out of the city and that's why that's why i like to listen on the podcast too on the way to the rink and back so um uh, teammates call it a farm up here just because we have a little bit of room for the animals but uh no me and my wife both love it a little bit of uh breathing breathing room here and it's nice to go downtown every once in a while get get it's more exciting when you you don't live down there and you kind of miss it so um we're we're happy even though we're we're all out of the way and doing things a little different so it's working out for us three cats three dogs a child you're dude you're running out of names that's true we gotta we gotta probably could use some help on if there's any any more babies on the way or any more dogs <laughs> or cats but we've been uh we've been collecting the dogs and the cats all around where i've kind of played we didn't get any in chicago last year um maybe that was the baby but um yeah i think we're gonna be trying to be set on the three dogs and the three cats <laughs> You're a first-time caller, but a long-time listener. Uh, Kaz, congratulations that you've been patient in your journey. You're learning how valuable that is uh, as, a, as a father now. Uh, thanks for your time, pal. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Kaz. Thanks. You know, 
what still gets me out of that whole conversation was it was Kaz who reached out to you, Hutch, after hear, hearing the interview. Yeah, he he actually listened to our first podcast episode and fired a note along just asking how often they'd be coming out and, and that uh, started a dialogue. Uh, thanks to the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs organization, he had to clear it with their PR staff, but they were happy to have him join us as well. So uh, just great that he wanted to be a part of it. And and he also, uh, in the interview, referenced the, the Thatcher Demko interview. So it's nice to see that the, what we're doing here is making an impact on, on goaltenders at all levels. And Kevin, I think you've heard from some other guys as well. Yeah, it's been kind of neat to to get the feedback. Obviously, we we saw Eddie Lack on Twitter talk about uh, having to run second fiddle to Roberto right. Luongo and not getting the first interview. <laughs> I had a good chuckle there. We'll have to have Eddie on soon um, as he recovers from hip surgery. But some other messages too behind the scenes. Brian Elliott reaching out and saying how cool it was to to hear Luongo in that first episode, a guy that he looked up to um, and and looks up to um, with some similar ideas about the position as he had. And I thought, you know, just getting that feedback from those guys was pretty cool. And we've heard from some others from goalie coaches around the league and stuff. So um, it, it's great. It's great that we've been able to hear back from goalies and great that we've been able to get feedback from listeners and, you know, keep reaching out, I guess, is, and let us know what other things you'd like to hear. Well, we already know that from Kaz because he's in his car uh, driving downtown uh, from from up north. Uh, he, he's had a revolving door of partners, and and he's really he's really found something here in in the other hutch. But uh, McElhaney and Pickard uh, being plucked off waivers uh, opened up some some road in front of him. So we'll continue to follow his career. Uh, will he be the next Jordan Biddington, a guy that puts in so much time behind the scenes and then tries to uh, cash in? Now, to listener questions, and we're going with three this week. The first of which I can relate to because I need a hip replacement, and it's likely due to the fact of playing with a butterfly all these years. So we're going to lean on our good friend, strength and conditioning coach, Maria Mountain. Maria, along with training athletes, also specializes in goalie training from Revolution Conditioning. And we're leaning on her because of this question about hips. Over to Hutch. So, Maria, we had a question from uh, one of our listeners, uh, Steve. Steve, I, I don't know where you are. I wish you'd told us. Uh, somewhere out there. Thanks for listening, Steve. Uh, Steve wants to know, what is your best advice for younger goaltenders to avoid hip injuries? I watch so many practices where coaches overwork goalies, especially at the youth hockey ages. What do you think, Maria? Yeah, it's a great question. It's kind of the million-dollar question, and it it literally keeps me up at night because I don't think we know the impact of of butterfly and now the reverse VH. I think this is really the first generation that's grown up from, you know, little kids all the way through. So we don't know what the impact is going to be. Um, so I think, I think Steve has a good reason to be concerned. Um, so, you know, I, I get a lot of emails from parents who are looking for the training solution. You know, what training should my child right. do so that their hips will stay healthy? But one thing to keep in mind is that, I think a lot of this FAI, and it's not just me, it's the way the body develops, it's overuse. It's not something that just like tearing an ACL, you you know, you, you land the wrong way, you cut the wrong way, you have the wrong kind of impact and you tear your ACL. FAI or hip impingement is, is something that develops over time. So I want to make it really clear that training doesn't undo that damage. Um, I think it can help... Um, maybe help reduce it or mitigate it a bit. But I think especially for the youngsters, the number one thing you can do is is minimize exposure. Now that doesn't mean, oh, so kids shouldn't go into the butterfly. But yeah, I've been at practices and camps and Hutch, I'm sure you have too, where, you know, these kids are smashing into the butterfly, um, you know, on repeat for minutes and minutes and days and days and hours and hours and that all adds up so I think if you can minimize the exposure um I know that I don't think the goalies like it but I think if you had maybe three goalies at practice um to spread it around a little bit you know that that's probably a good place to start an off season where they aren't smashing themselves on the ice where they're playing a different sport when they're a little kid I think that's another great strategy it's uh it's a really really tough one to answer for sure isn't it 
um, having, having to work in with teams and coaches in a way that's going to work for everybody. Is there, is there an aspect though of conditioning that can help? I mean, is, is being flexible better for kids? Uh, what, what could they be doing? Yeah, I think kids by nature, most kids by nature, uh, especially younger kids, they're pretty bendy. So if you're little kid, you know, once they start growing, then it becomes an issue because our bodies grow from the bones and the bones don't send a memo to the muscles that, hey, you know what, like we're going to just grow an inch and a half all of a sudden. So, you know, those bones grow and now you have a young uh, athlete who's just chronically tight everywhere. You know, they can't touch their toes. They, it, you know, and so I think if you have a kid that's sort of tight everywhere because they've just gone through a big growth spurt, then yeah, there's just, you know, basic stretching program is a, is a good idea. Um, I think if your child is, you know, is pretty bendy as most of us were when we were kids, except they can't get into a butterfly or when they do, you know, if, if their coach has them trying RVH or, you know, they see it on TV, they want to try it, they want to do it. And, and that is uncomfortable for them. If they have sort of a significant localized deficiency, then, you know, I think it's probably worthwhile to, to take him or her in to see a physical therapist to just say, Hey, like, you know, is this normal? You know, what should we do? What should we do about that? Right. It's, in, it's interesting you talk about limiting exposure because we had Thatcher Demko on and he's had both hips done, had some serious injuries over the years. But one of the things he did speak to was having, um, you know, fewer good reps. Uh, let's not try and exhaust ourselves doing medium quality reps. Let's get five good ones and then get out. And I think maybe that attention to detail might have some benefits uh, physically as well then. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's all about deliberate practice and um you know and yeah and you guys nailed it exactly it's yeah practice makes permanent uh yeah. you know perfect practice is what makes quality so and it's very much like developing speed and agility you know those things shouldn't be tiring or exhausting we're we're learning to move with precision we're learning the skill of moving and our body isn't going to learn the skill of moving by smashing out uh 40% of crappy reps. And so, so last one, we've had some conversations in the past about building up the knee stacks and whether that might relieve some pressure on the hips. And I understand you'd be in favor of letting kids give that a go. Yeah, I like that. I think even at all ages, if you can add a little bit to your knee stacks, I think I've seen a few cases too. And again, man, the parents are just trying to do their best. They had this little creature called a goalie that <laughs> is like, <laughs> what, what is it? You know, but, um, you know, I think, and then they hear that, well, it helps a goalie if they're taller. So some parents are putting kids into step steel extreme right. to get them more height, but that actually is going to change the mechanics and it's going to put more torque on the knee and hip. So maybe keep, keep them out of that step steel extreme and look at, yeah, can you add an extra shim to that knee stack? Um, and, and get, you know, the knee sort of above ankle height when they're in their butterfly, you know, those little things help because with hip impingement and, and, you know, the labral tears that come with it and those things, it's, it's not something they won't feel it. They'll say, Oh, it feels fine. It feels fine. Um, you know, but then over time they're building that bony callus. So, um, you know, yeah, and, and if they really have positions they can't get into, then they shouldn't be trying to smash themselves into those positions over and over and over. We really need to protect our goalie's hips the way we think about protecting a pitcher's shoulders. You know, we, we would never, or you know, have a pitcher at a young age or, or hopefully not, you know, throwing reps and reps and reps because, oh, it feels okay. Pitch count for goaltenders. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. Maria, thanks for taking a little time out of the day for us. Pleasure. Hutch, she is a, one of our favorites because she's not a goaltender, but she's taken up the position just to be able to relate a little bit more to the goaltenders and those athletes that she does train. Next question is pointed directly at a Vesna Trophy finalist. And with that angle, over to Woody. This question comes from Mark Everhart, who checks in, says, Hey guys, always look forward to the pod. Keep up the good work. My very niche question, I've noticed that Connor Hellebuck has a very unique stick position 
that seems new to his game this year. If you haven't caught it, it looks like he's holding his stick almost parallel to the ice and lowers it as the shooter is advancing. I'm sure this is something he's developed, but I want to know more on the why of the technique. Uh, Well, Mark, we happen to notice that a little bit last year and especially this summer uh, when we were on the ice with Connor and we got you the answer to that question. Basically what I'm doing is I'm putting the anchor in. That's kind of what I'm doing. I'm I'm getting the little foundation thing, so my feet right, my pelvic tilt, and my core activated. And then from there, everything just needs to fall into place. And I, and I know it's working when I'm able to just be loose and I tap the stick, loose, and loose hands, maybe shove them a little deeper in my gloves, you know, just the little things that just make you calm up top. We followed that up by asking Hellebuck what that anchor, that foundation is for him in his mind, how it's changed during his off-ice work with Adam Francilia over the last couple summers, and whether there were times he needed to go back to it as a reset during his Vesna Trophy finalist season with the Jets two years ago. The foundation is like the pelvic tilt and this is the stance and the balance. That is off ice and on ice. Like those two go hand in hand. Then you take that, go on the ice, and you get your, your smaller details, as in like where you want your balance on your skates and where you want your skates digging in the ice and your hands. And so it all starts with the, the core and then it comes up from there. I don't think I ever had to fall back on it. I think through the entire year I was tinkering with it a little bit, but the same foundation was there and then I tinkered off that. So the smaller details off of starting with what I just said, the core and the tilt and, and the balance. And I started tinkering with where I wanted things, hands, stick, position, balance on the skates and, and all those little things. And that kept my mind progressing forward as opposed to having to ever fall back on it. Incredible, because when a shooter's coming in on me, I'm thinking, don't fall down, don't fall down. And is the guy right-handed or left-handed? I know, it's it's not very scientific. And then you go through everything that uh, that Connor's uh, thinking of. Final question uh, deals with uh, goaltending training and the, the mind games that we play with each other or shooters play with the goaltenders. Back to Hutch as... Shooters and goaltenders continue the age-old practice of scouting each other. Thanks, Darren. I chatted with Eli Wilson, who's a former NHL goaltending coach with the Ottawa Senators. He's a longtime WHL goaltending coach who today is working with the Tri-City Americans, and he's one of the leading private coaches in the business as well. Eli uh, seemed like the perfect fit for this question, as I think you'll see. Okay, Eli, thanks for joining us today. We've got uh, one of our listener questions. Adam from New York has written in and asked, uh, we read a lot about skills coaches working with NHL players today, like Austin Matthews, to teach them new shots and releases to deceive goaltenders. How do you teach a goalie to deal with deception like this? And of course, Eli, we've called on you today because you've done some collaborative work with the coach who teaches these tricks to Austin Matthews and many NHL stars. I'm talking about Daryl Belfry. And I know the two of you have spent many hours talking about the progression of the game and the ongoing battle between goaltender and shooter. So Eli, uh, life's getting a lot harder for us goaltenders today. How can you teach a goalie to deal with this? Is it patience? Is it experience? What can you do to design your training to help a goalie out now? Well, I think the biggest thing is when you're you're setting up your drills with your shooters, you have uh, options for the shooters to to um, not just have one dictated play that's going to happen. You have it open up so they have options for shots and passes and and pulling the puck before they're shooting or pushing the puck before they're shooting so that um, your goaltender can you know start to get used to that part of the game and understand it and see it when it's going to happen. And uh, I think the biggest thing is, is uh, the reads before the play happens. So you have your soft focus and you're ready and you identify your, the shooter's options early. And, um, you know, that's what's happening in the game and that's how the game's being played more and more. Um, but I think the biggest thing is when you, when you design and put together a practice for, you know, a goalie of, I don't want to say this, but a decent level or a decent understanding of the position once you get the, you know, the technical part down pat then you can really work on the tactical approach of it and we always have on the ice outside of our basic warm-up drills all our drills that we do um, have an opportunity for a shooter to change things up and mix things up so that it does mirror exactly what can happen in the game 
so you must be working almost as closely with your shooters as you are with your goaltender to, to train them as well for what it is they could be doing to, to both help your goalies and I guess for them as well to learn how to deceive a goaltender. Yeah, we talk to the to the shooters and, and you know, for example, if we're on the ice with um, one goaltender and three shooters, I want to try and get those shooters uh, better as well. And it gives them an opportunity, like you said, to improve on their game and, and take their game to the next level and maybe see you know, the game at the, you know, at a, at a higher level every time that they're on the ice. And, you know, just the other day we were doing a cross ice pass drill where you catch, hold, then release. Um, and then we did it where we catch release. And then we give the shooters the options of the two. And it gives the goaltender an opportunity to really see a live part of the game that, that does make a difference in goal scoring today. So, um, it's nice to just watch it kind of under, unfold in front of you and, you know, having the time to, to work with Daryl and see the different shots and different approaches and the way that he catches passes and releases pucks. Um, you know, we try and do the same thing when we're working with our shooters and our drills so that they not only improve, but um, they help our goalie understand the game the way it's played. I guess it's fair to say that with everybody – sort of elevating their game on, on both sides. Hockey's getting better than ever. 100%. It's, it's, it's actually really exciting to see and see these young players getting to the NHL. And, and I've always said that, you know, talent isn't developed in the NHL. It comes to the NHL from outside, and, and you're seeing that more and more and more. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Eli, and thanks for answering one of our reader questions. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. It is incredible how... Specialized coaches, the shooting coaches, the skilled coaches for players, and the goaltending coaches are working together, but they're really out to help their clients beat the other guy. It's it's cooperation with a wink, and in this case, it certainly does work. Our thanks to Eli Wilson, Connor Hellebuck for his cooperation, and of course, Maria Mountain from Revolution Conditioning. And Kaz, we wish him all the best. You may have heard a little story about Ryan Miller becoming the winningest U.S. goaltender of all time in the National Hockey League. Ryan Miller has accomplished a great deal in the NHL and professional hockey. And in listener questions, we invite you to send a question in that maybe is directed towards Ryan, and we'll do our best to get the winningest American goaltender of all time to answer your inquiry. Our thanks to Kevin Woodley and David Hutchison for founding In Goal Radio, the podcast, and giving goaltenders a voice. And remember, people like Kaz are listening. Professional goaltenders are paying attention to this podcast. Why aren't you and your friends and your coaches? Get everybody involved and subscribe to In Goal Radio, the podcast. I'm Darren Millard. Thanks for listening, and make sure you keep your head up and your stick on the ice. And don't forget the backup towel.